to the Need to Know Music Show with me, Ronan McManus, here on Switchbox TV. And today I'm joined by one of the finest songwriters the UK has ever, ever produced. Justin Curry and his band Delamitri have been a huge influence on me personally and my songwriting. So it's absolutely joy for me. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by him now. Uh, Justin, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Ronan? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, how's uh, this year been so far? Um, well, I, as weird as everybody else's, I guess. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a few days of panic and then a few days of just, of, who gives a damn, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, we were, we were, Delamitri were lucky in that we finished this album that we made the day before lockdown. So we drove home on the Sunday and everything locked down on the Monday. In fact, we got the gear out on the Friday and then we all, the, the, uh, me and Ian drove home on the Sunday. And then we, it, what was odd was we then had to remote mix it with a, a producer called Dan Austin brilliant producer, but we hadn't worked with him before. So getting our heads around how he worked and the kind of things we wanted was really difficult doing it remotely. Um, I was going to say, was he, was, he doing, was he doing mixes and sending them and then, then, then he was doing, how it was happening? Because he was working from home as well. So you would get mixes at midnight. So you were kind of always on. You were always, you'd be watching the telly and then bing, oh Christ, I better go and listen to these mixes. Um, and you would get four at a time, and it, it, it just became, it took months to mix. Just because we weren't there. We weren't there seeing exactly what he was doing. Um, yeah. uh, and eventually what we did was, he, Dan, found this brilliant bit of um, software, which creates a platform that, that allowed him to stream 24-bit files in real time. So we can, and then we just set up a Zoom call like this, and then we would just say to him, right, okay, can we just move that a bit, or change that a bit? So it, in the, end, time actually, down. Yeah. in the end, we, we did like a sort of 12 hour Zoom call and we got it all sorted out. So if only we'd kind of done that earlier on, it wouldn't take so long to mix. But other than that, lockdown's it's been fine. Yeah, so have you been doing any sort of um, any sort of live things or anything like that? Have you done any sort of streams and things like that? I've done a few, but it's just the quality is so low. You know, you just I'm just using my phone camera because I, I don't have that sort of technical setup to, to record video particularly well. So I've tried to limit that to things as much as possible. Um, I've done a few. I've done maybe three or something, and I've turned quite a lot down. Yeah, it's just, it's, it can be a bit of a nightmare with that. I mean, I started off doing some live streams, and um, I mean, I'm a, also, I do Irish music as well as sort of rock and uh, music yeah. stuff. So here, you kind of hit just on St. Patrick's Week. So it was the, the worst, the worst time possible for Irish musicians. Yeah. So I did a few things just on the phone, and I've kind of kind of developed it just for that reason, um, through software, to try and get something that resembles a... a, 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 a decent just, sound. A decent sound, yeah. It's just a bit so have, you, have you got a way of getting decent mics into your phone? Well, I've just, I don't use the phone. I go through the laptop and I've found right. like a, like a, so it's, a free, it's all free software. Um, uh -huh. But it's, so yeah, you can go through a desk and into your, into your thing. And it's just kind of, for me, you've got a bit of reverb and a bit of, a bit of, and you can put graphics on the screen and stuff. So yeah, right. it's a, it takes a little bit of fiddling around, but got there in the end so yeah we're trying to trying to up the game with that one a bit it's been one of the one of the it's been one of the sort of challenges of lockdown i think and have but, you managed um, to get together with any fellow musicians since lockdown eased uh yeah i've got through got together with, with the guitarist and got to do some a live stream he's, he's got a barber shop so we did a live stream from the barber shop which was awesome. kind of cool um but i mean what's happened with you guys have you been have you been in the same room with the lads at all We've done a photo shoot, so we've been in the same forest, uh, <laughs> which is quite odd actually because it, it was initially it was quite hard to concentrate because we'd, we'd been in the studio for three weeks. I mean, not everybody was there the whole time, but it was quite an intense recording period. It was like 12 hour days and no days off, which was great actually. Uh, and then all of a sudden we didn't see each other for like five months. Um, and then we were sort of standing in the forest getting a photograph taken. It was quite odd because all we wanted to do was just go to the pub and have a chat, you know. Um, yeah. but that, that was not to be. What do you mean? So that way of recording is that was that your preferred method? You like to hit it in one go? Is that how you've always done it, or is that something that you that is just for this time? It's how we've always done it since some of us circus parades in the mid nineties. I mean, bits of twisted were sort of done like that. Um, the first two albums were done ve um, in re really odd piecemeal ways with programmed drums and everything was overdubbed. Um, but yeah, I prefer to rehearse the stuff and then pretty much, well, we prefer to rehearse the stuff and pretty much record it as, as it was rehearsed and then add a few overdubs. We did more overdubs than we actually than we expected because uh, we did quite a bit of 
chin stroking and figuring out that we didn't expect to do because we thought the rehearsal arrangements were fine. But in the studio, uh, we started changing things a wee bit. But mo most of it is really three or four of us cu cutting the track live with a couple of overdubs. So what's the sort of sound of this new record? Is it is it is it kind of a traditional Delamitri sound, or have you got got anything surprising up your sleeves? Well, we we realised when we finished recording it that it's actually the first record Delamitri have ever made without any other players on it. So it's just the five of us. There's no, you know, there's no hired sax player or violinist or anything because there was always one or two things on every record where we hired a session guy to come in and do something that we couldn't play. Uh, so that, there's something quite satisfying about that. Um, uh, when we were writing the songs, because Ian, it was really Ian's idea to do another record. I, I wasn't completely, particularly convinced about it because I think I listen to the Delamitri catalogue a bit more often than Ian does because I really like a lot of it. And I, I, I quite like listening to it late at night when I've had a glass of wine and just trying to get a kind of listener's perspective on it. And sometimes I hate the records and sometimes I love them. And when I, uh, when I love them, I think, why would we ever make another another Delamitri record? Because we're not going to make anything nearly as good as something like Twisted or or that sounds as good as some of the Suckers Parade or is as interesting as uh, Waking Hours. So, or it's got as much, much energy as those records. So I was really sceptical about it. So what I said to Ian was, I'm going to go away for two, three weeks and just try and write what I think are Delamitri songs rather than solo songs. Um, and I thought that was going to be quite hard and it was a lot easier than I thought because as long as you're thinking, right, I'm going to take this to these guys in this band. I knew who the, I knew who the band was. I knew who the members of the band was, where, sorry. And um, so I wrote a ton of things and then Ian wrote a ton of things. And once we put the, the co-writes together with the things I'd written, we thought, well, this, it does sound sufficiently like Delamitri. Um, I mean, some people think, think it sounds sort of halfway between the solo stuff and Delamitri. I think it, I would never have made a solo record like this. I wouldn't have made a solo record as good as this. It's 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 much more vibrant and um, uh, it's a, a lot rockier in a good way than than most of the stuff I've done solo. The solo records I just I really enjoy um, hearing you uh, that sort of strip back and um, and I mean a song I, I was going to ask you about it later on, but I'll go into it now. But yeah. Little Stars is a song that kind of really just just leapt up and hit me in the face when I heard it for the first right. time and. So those ones I had to go back and listen to 25 times in a row immediately. And uh, the one thing that struck, that struck me is um, is the falsetto bit in the chorus. I'd, I'd just be terrified of writing something like that because my falsetto is one of the first things that goes live on any sort of right. tour. How do, you, how do you find the challenges of, of touring and, and, you know, do you, do you ever have thoughts of, Will I will I write, will I have that in the in the song? Do you have a thoughts of live or how you might cope with that? Yeah, I mean not when I'm writing, um, but if we if we write something and record it, I'll know pretty soon if it's a a, a voice raker. There's there's certain things. I, I I don't know about you, but I find songs not that are not at the top of my range, but they're reasonably high. Where where I'm consistently having to hit fairly high notes all the way through the song, they just kill me live. I end up yeah. having to kind of swallow and there's a, there's a few songs that I've written, even if I take them down a semitone, I can't really get through them without getting a bit squeaky towards the end. So yeah, I th you, and I th consequently they don't get performed that much because if you don't do them right at the beginning of the gig and, and you don't want to do them at the beginning of the gig if you're a bit nervous and you don't want to do them too late. So yeah, I, I, you, you think about that after they're written. Uh, falsetto, yeah. I've always found falsetto quite, quite easy. My falsetto is the last thing that goes but the funny thing, I'm getting older, I'm 55 now, and in the last, I would say, six years, I didn't have, I didn't have many problems in my 40s, but in the last six or seven years, um, I've lost about four notes off the top of my falsetto. Because I used to be able to sing, like, kind of girl backing vocal parts. Um, it's part of the reason why we never had girl singers, because I, I, me and to a certain extent, Ian and Ashley could sing really high. And in fact, they, they can still sing really high, but I've lost... Yeah, I've lost at least five notes from, from the top of my falsetto. So, so, so I've only got about four notes left in falsetto. <laughs> <laughs> so you might find uh, the outro of here and now is going to be uh, good. I might, might find some girls in the back. The back end well, of I, can't, I can't hit that uh, consistently anymore. So when we do it live, I get asked to do the, the lead line and I do the harmony below it. Um, right. I was talking to um, Hamish from e AWB and they, they used to sing a lot of stuff in falsetto. And... Uh, we were at a jazz club a few years ago and he said to me, 
because we were talking about this and our aging voices not and he sang that night and his voice sounded absolutely amazing i thought and he's what maybe 10 maybe 15 years older than me maybe a bit less um but he said to me i i did something about saving my falsetto and i was about to say to him what 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 is it so he must have found a way of some way of exercising or something or some way of using it uh, where he, he didn't lose the notes that you, that you naturally lose with age. And then he turned to me and started talking to somebody else and I never, I never found out what it was. You know? And the, uh, the secret of life is, and then he yeah. interrupted like, <laughs> yeah. well, if, you ever, if you ever get to the bottom of that, then, uh, then you know, drop us a line. I'd be interested yeah. to know. <laughs> Will do. So um, I was going to say about the band relationships, how, how you, have yeah. you guys sort of found, have, has it changed, is it different now to how it was when you guys were younger and or how how's Yeah, that? The, I think there's a bit less tension when you're older men and I think you're a wee bit less competitive with each other. Uh, and also, we all know what we can all do. We know who's good at what and who's not good at what. So there's no, yeah, there's no, you don't get narky at some, like, when you're younger, you, you'll tend to, I mean, I, I, was, I was a real pain in the ass when I was younger because I would very often ask people to do things that I should have known they, that they weren't capable of or they, or they wouldn't want to do. Um, and sometimes you can get quite good compromise results out of that, but most of the time you just piss people off. So now we just, everybody just does what they do and, it's, and it, it seems to work. Um, so yeah, it was pretty... Uh, I mean, Ian and I will often, we, we often used to have major disagreements in the studio about just parts, you know, like, no, that part's wrong, or, and I would sing parts to people, and sometimes that's really irritating, because they just want to work stuff out for themselves. Um, yeah. So we seem, that seems to have, that seems to be a thing of the past, I think. Uh, so it was, it was genuinely enjoyable. I'm not saying, I, I don't think enjoying making a record necessarily means you make a good record, so I mean, we made, the, I mean, Waking Hours was hellish to make. It was absolute hell. We made it about four times and it, it became extremely fraught at times. Ian and I had a massive argument in the in Chipping Norton when we were recording uh, for the third or fourth time, three tracks from Waking Hours, a huge falling out. It might, that might have been fatal, actually, had we not both woken up the next day and apologised to each other. <laughs> Uh, so I think at the age, you, yeah, the confrontation goes, and I think maybe you lose a bit of creative tension that way. So, but what you do gain is a, just a kind of mellowness and an ease of working, you know. So the records sound different. The records are less frenetic and less, they're a bit less forced. So I think we've lost, we've definitely lost energy, but I think we've gained a kind of um, uh, just, I, I, I think, I think this record's slightly easier to listen to than some of the earlier stuff, which is, which is just a bunch of boys really trying to prove they're good. Whereas now we're not really trying to prove anything. We just think, well, this is a good song and that's, that's a good arrangement. That should be on the record. I think it'd be like, like I can see what, you know, Waking Hours was a big record for you guys, wasn't it? Cause you'd yeah. have the, and you'd have the, the eponymous uh, one. They kind of had, you, ch you seem to change everything. Um, yeah. If you, Pardon the, the the wrong album title, but uh, you sort <laughs> I was of confused so, for a bit. <laughs> so did you? That was a, a matter of you finding your own voice in that. Because what was that process like? Because yeah. you kind of um, reading uh, a bit of, a bit about them. You spoke a little bit about that before, um, and it sort of seemed to you you kind of re reevaluated everything and came back with a completely different sound. Yeah, um, I think the, the main thing that happened was we went to the states in nineteen eighty six after we'd been dropped by Chrysalis. Um, so we'd done, we'd made this very, I would say English more than Scottish, kind of English indie records, um, which a few college radio DJs in America just loved. You know, they were playing the Smiths and they would play our, our record, James, and think these quite, quite busy, very earnest, um, with, with quite sort of angst-ridden lyrics. So we were kind of part of the tail end of that scene in America, that college radio scene in America. And then what happened was we got dropped by Chrysalis. We spent the last 2,000 quid that we had on air tickets to America. And we stayed with fans, well, mainly fans' parents, but um, some of the fans were old enough to have their own apartments. Um, and just sort of lived with American families and then drove thousands of miles between, or hundreds of miles, uh, multiples of hundreds of miles between gigs and slept on picnic benches and had this kind of... Uh, 
formative experience, you know, in our early 20s, where we were basically hopeless. We were completely impoverished. Um, I mean, we had to ask people to throw money onto the stage at one point because we didn't have enough money to get us gas from LA to um, Iowa. Uh, and we, the, one, the thing that really inspired us about America was we would go into these college radio stations and they'd be playing R.E.M. and, you know, some real college radio bands that, you know, I don't know, Miracle Legion or something. Uh, but they would also, you would speak to these DJs and they were really into music, but they also liked really what we, we perceived in our punk values as being really uncool things. But they were good uncool things. You know, because we, I mean, we, we really hated things like Bruce Springsteen and we just thought it was all kind of bombast. And um, but you talk to these people and you go, all oh, right, well, there's nothing really wrong with guitar solos, you know. I mean, we like television for God's sake, so why shouldn't we like more mainstream American music? And we started listening to more, well, we, we also started listening to quite a lot of country music when we came back. Because at that time, there were things happening like Steve Hill and Lyle Lovett and Dwight Yoakam, where, where they were kind of refashioning country music and writing really good songs, especially Lyle Lovett, I think. It's Lyle Lovett and Steve Hill. So we, we kind of naturally became Americanized and we kind of divested ourselves of, the, of all the sort of punk badges that said, this is the only way you can do things. You know, you can't have too many chords and you, you can't be showing off and you can't be too good. And also Ian's guitar playing was really developing. He was learning different styles he, uh, and he was becoming a technically really capable guitar player. And it just seemed a waste not to use that. Um, so I think naturally, because we, was, we started to sound a bit more mid-Atlantic, um, and then all, also Ian said to me, why do you write songs on your own rather than us writing everything collectively? Because it will save us a lot of time, which it did. So it used to take us months to write one song. Um, so I started writing kind of narrative songs that were really influenced by country. And then we started arranging them with pedal steel and bottleneck and things. And it just became a different beast. And we knew what we were doing would be abhorred by quite a lot of people that liked the first album. But we, we just thought, well, fuck this. You know, th 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 these are mainstream songs. They should probably be, be somewhere in the mainstream. So let's not worry about losing a kind of indie crowd because we're not making that kind of music anymore. So it was partly an organic change and it was just partly something that America did to us, you know. It's like you get it, you used to get it quite a lot in the, in the 80s where the bands would, like major bands with label deals and all that sort of stuff would go to America for like three or four months and they would really cut their teeth in front of these club crowds and theater crowds and they would come back like a rock band, whereas they started off like a maybe slightly arty 80s pop band or something. Um, and that's, that's effectively what happened to us. You know, the crowds would cheer when there was a, a guitar break. And we thought, God, that's a guitar solo. We didn't even know that was a guitar solo. So we got kind of, ro we got rockified by, by the audience in, in America. And we just loved America so much because we were living with real people, working class families, middle class families, you know, people living in tiny little apartments, people living in big houses with pools. Uh, and everybody was so gracious and generous. And we thought, God, this is not what, we thought America was like. We thought America was just full of like crazy fascists, you know, and uh, we discovered it was full of really enlightened, cultured, you know, and in a lot of cases, very left-wing people uh, or, or surprisingly left-wing um, considering what, what our preconceptions had been. So yeah, we got Yankified. Um, and I, so I think that's the, that was the main, the main thing that changed us. And I don't think anybody could really accuse you lyrically of of, uh, of going all poppy and that you know I think there's always been your stories kind of dark darker side of life or the kind of the the sort of um, you can sort of feel the sort of working class roots in it I think that, so that so even though you maybe you're you're going more acoustic guitars and you're going more harmonies and stuff there's still definitely a um, an edge in there. Um, so yeah. I mean, how did you how did you, how did you find that first album was received? Uh, the 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 one before we sorry the us. second album sorry I saw yeah. the first album because the first so album do I, I so you do guys. I so do I it I sort of feels thought. like a new beginning it's a different sort yeah. of band well almost, we did you know we, we did think about changing the name and our manager Barbara Shores at the time persuaded us not, us not to because she thought she thought the American audience would stick with us which they did whereas the British audience I mean I'm talking just a few thousand people here you know maybe fifteen thousand people in the states at the most and maybe seven thousand people in the UK so quite a small national audience. And we lost the vast majority of the British audience because they were kind of, 
a lot of them are like cool indie kids uh, or real, really intense kind of geeky people that were very intense about the kind of music they listened to in very particular. So they, they were just, they felt betrayed by the change in the way the American audience didn't. So we decided not to change the name. But in a way, it would have been the first album by, by a band with a different name. So it was a different lineup and it, it did sound very different. Um, yeah. I mean, it was initially it was quite well received because we, we were still a kind of Inkies band. So we still got covered by the enemy and Melody Maker in spite of the fact they kind of wanted to hate us because we, the, 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 from the, you know, their role is to present, is to promote interesting uh, new music, not commercial music. And our music had become more commercial. Um, so initially they were kind of quite kind. And then as soon as we had a hit, I mean, quite rightly actually, they just thought, right, well, get them to fuck because they're, they're, no, longer, they're no longer relevant, which we weren't because we were in the charts. And we, all of a sudden we were a Scottish pop band, whereas prior to that, We've been a Glasgow indie band. Yeah, there's some great tracks on that on that album, and um, you know, I think, and then getting, then into the other. I mean, I I kind of really discovered you guys around the time of Twisted. Really, that's kind of uh, yeah. where I really kind of got. Um, and then I went back and rediscovered all those songs that I knew, but I didn't know that I yeah. knew. Yeah. Um, there was some, but those you, you know those some huge hits in those 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 those, those, those two albums. Um, Waking hours and and change and change everything. I mean, how did you find um, sort of touring around that time? Had it picked up a lot in that time? And what was the, what was the change in you guys? Well, it picked up overnight when nothing ever happens. Got into the charts, uh, and we did top of the pops overnight. The gigs went from a few hundred. We were picking up. We were selling maybe two fifty, three hundred, three hundred fifty tickets in universities. So not not necessarily to fans, just to curious people. Oh, there's a band on tonight in the student union. Um, and then all of a sudden we were playing to over a thousand people, literally overnight, because we'd been on national TV for a couple of weeks. We'd done all the daytime shows. We did some late night shows. Uh, so all of a sudden we were kind of known. Um, because the top 40 was such a big deal in those days, you got huge exposure over the four available TV channels. We were a Radio 1 band at the time. And um, uh, so we got loads of airplay and we got quite a lot of airplay on, on commercial stations as well. So it was a radical shift. Um, and and it was a joy. It was, you know, it, it wasn't a shock. It was just, wow, how lucky are we? You know, we've, we've been striving away for the best part of a decade, uh, not, not really getting anywhere other than winning very small pockets of fans in specific towns. And all of a sudden we're, you know, we're in the newspapers and we're on the telly and there are kids coming to see us. You know, I mean, we used to do in stores and there'd be like 10 year old kids singing the songs like, this is, this is mad, but it's really great. You know, it, it was, it was a very sort of vindicating feeling because we thought, well, we are making pop rock music. So, this is how it should go. You know, we shouldn't be playing to a couple of students wearing interesting national health specs. We should be playing to, uh, we should be playing to a wider audience because this is what we're doing now. So um, it was actually a, a huge amount of fun, I have to say. Pop melodies, but I mean, as I was saying before with this sort of darker sort of lyrical content, it must be quite funny to sort of see people out there sort of singing along this kisses thing goodbye, yeah. you know. So it's, it's like <laughs> the happiest breakup ever, you know. Yeah, I mean, the one, the one that always did our heads in was, uh, it was Be My Downfall, which is just about somebody. I was going to say, yeah. You know, say, and yeah. and, and you all, the, the couples always put their arms around each other and sing, sing it along. And I mean, they know it's about infidelity, you know. But <laughs> just sometimes you're standing on stage and you think, did they did they get together because they were being unfaithful to to other to other people? Um, I mean, that's this great. Is our song. <laughs> this is our song. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's very odd. Um, yeah, we we used to get described in the press quite a lot as bittersweet, where the music was quite bright and um, major key on the whole, and the lyrics always had some problem or drama going on in them. But I don't think we did that deliberately. I just think that's the natural way that I write. And that's something we learned from country music is that most country music love songs are about, you know, loss or infidelity or relationships not working out. Um, there are very few happy country and western songs. There's, I mean, there's lots of happy dance songs, you know, uh, and disco songs, but not really, but not country songs because they've got to tell a story and it's there's not much story in I love you, you make me feel free, yee-haw. 
Uh, whereas there's loads of interesting stories in, um, you know, I'm addicted to morphine and my wife's, <laughs> my, my wife's locked the fridge with a padlock and um, her, brother want, her brother wants to kill me because he knows I've been shagging the waitress down the street. That stuff's really interesting to write. So I think, I think, that, I think that's where that came from. Is that the new album title? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, missed the trick. Switchbox. I'll just ask you about a few of the, the songs individually. Is um, yeah. Well, generally, I think I feel like you seem to find emotions and tensions in seemingly ordinary moments. I mean, driving the brakes on, uh, setting a moment, yeah. it's, it's in a certain moment of time. Yeah. Um, are, are, are these autobiographical? Uh, if not, how do you get inside the, the emotions of a fictional situation so well? Um, and is there any cost playing these live, emotional cost in playing them live? The, well, on, on the autobiographical thing, some are more autobiographical than others. None of them, none of them are 100% autobiographical because you might take a situation from life or you might write something down after being at a party or something, or being in a situation that's that's odd. Uh, but you need to add more drama. So there's quite a lot of fiction as, as well. And, and quite often, as you know yourself, you're not you're not singing directly from your own perspective. You're singing from a character's perspective that you've kind of. So you're looking through their eyes, and you're thinking, like, what would this guy feel like if that happens? Well, that that could be quite interesting. Um, but people that know you well will know will spot the autobiographical things. And it, that's only tricky. Like if you write a song that's really sp has specific meaning to you, the hardest thing is playing it to the band for the first time. I mean, I, I've actually seen the burst out crying a couple of times playing things to the band because I think this is, this is a bit close to the bone because they, <laughs> they, they know what this shit's about, you know. Uh, and that can be sometimes really tricky. Um, but and, and with an audit, by the time you get these songs in front of an audience, you've re, you've demoed them, you've recorded them, you've rehearsed them, they become a bit more abstract, um, and really, uh, really, all you're doing is trying to hit the notes and remember the words. You're and and you and, and hopefully that's where the emotion for the audience comes from, just getting it right, rather than because I think if you start, um, if you start trying to invest a lot of genuine emotion into singing something, I, I, I kind of don't think it works. There's a famous Aretha Franklin thing about where she said, soul singing is, is not about what you give away, it's about what you hold back. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. You know, if you, if you just let rip, I mean, sometimes you do find yourself being emotionally affected on stage because something I thought occurs to you and you think, oh God, that's what that line's about. I've forgotten what that line's about. Um, and you can start losing it a bit and you just have to rein it back in or just laugh about something or, look at somebody in the audience that's got a weird look in their face and then get, get grounded in, in the reality of it again. You, you've got to kind of almost set yourself in the, in the professionalism of actually getting the job done, sort of to insulate yeah. yourself from the emotion of it. Yeah, and let, let the song do the emotion and you're really there to entertain the audience. Hopefully the song will move the audience, but I, I mean, unless you're like a, a free improviser, I think, most music is just about get, getting it right in the performance. It's not about channeling some deep well of, of pain or, or, or confusion. I, I think that, uh, I mean, some people seem to do that, but I, I, you know, if you listen to Van Morrison or somebody, um, you feel like they're doing that, but I don't, I don't know if they are. I think, they're, I think they're just trying to get it right. Yeah, I just sort of think if you if you were to go there every time, I think I think you'd survive one of your tours, would you? Well, I think I kind of think if you look at Amy Amy Winehouse, uh, the extraordinary thing about Amy Winehouse is that every time she performed those songs live, she did them quite differently, and it was obviously she felt it incumbent upon her as an artist to invest each performance with a with a new feeling and and, and new nuances, and I think that really is, I think that's quite devastating because. You you can never you can't you can't phone in one note, and sometimes you need to phone in a note because you're you're thinking shit. I've got a guitar change next, or or um, I don't really know the words that well to the next song. I need to remember the words. So, so quite a lot of the time, your mind has to wander. But people, yeah. somebody like Amy, Amy Winehouse was completely invested in the moment and used all sorts of tricks, whether it's drink or whether it emotional turmoil. To kind of channel all that, I think you know, it's brilliant, but it's also really risky. I think, personally and 
in terms of the performance. It's really risky. Sleep Instead of Teardrops is one of my all-time all favourite songs. Um, yeah. And you probably get this question a lot, but um, how was it not included on, on, the, on some of the songs that was played the first time around? It was a huge mistake when, um, when because Ian and I had set out, because we've we been listening to a lot of Teenage Fan Club, and we thought, let's make a record that's kind of like Teenage Fan Club. It's a power pop record, not, not loads of acoustic guitars, loads of electric guitars, quite chimey and um, with big choruses. So that's what we were trying to do. And of course, right. as usually okay. nothing goes according to plan, we sort of failed to do that. But I had this big ballads, which we, I mean, we all loved it. Uh, we put strings on it, we did the whole, went the whole nine yards. But when Ian and I were sequencing the records and there were, I think we'd recorded 17, 18 songs from that record. So to get everything on the vinyl and to sequence it as a power pop record, Every time we tried to put Sleep Instead of Teardrops into the sequence, it just created this big hole and everything just fell into the hole of it. And we tried putting it at the end and it didn't make any sense at the end because it was a bit too bleak or something. Uh, even though it's a, it ends in a major key, it's still... Uh, and we just weren't comfortable with it. So we, Ian and I, in our infinite wisdom, because there's always he and I in the sequence, everything, but, I mean, with a bit of advice from the producer maybe. Um, and we dropped it and, uh, and then... I mean, there were a few things we weren't happy about. I didn't think it was a great vocal. There was, we had some doubts about it, but it became obvious really quickly um, that we should have put it on the record. It was a huge mistake. But it means the B-sides are good, and it was on the B-sides. So it's like, it's like the best B-side ever. It's just like... Well, we, we just were really like, into B-sides. We, we loved <laughs> B-sides because it was, you know, B-sides allow you to relax a bit. Uh, and sometimes it allows you to use songs that don't work that well within the sort of standard rock format. Um, so you can just funny about it a bit, and and sometimes in doing that, you 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 make things that are better than anything on the on the album proper. And I, I've always liked that, you know. I've always liked bands think, with B sides. I think in the frame is another one that fits in that. Yeah, um, uh, you know that's a beautiful song. That was written for Twisted, and that was that was in my Lemons Head stage because I really loved the way Evan Dando sang without any vibrato and wrote these seemingly really simple sounding melodies, but they were actually quite clever. Um, and I don't know, maybe at the time I felt like it was too much of a pastiche of Evan Dando or something. Um, and again, we were trying to make a rock, we were trying to make a sort of US rock record with Tw Twisted. You know, we'd been, I'd been listening to loads of Nirvana and Kirk had been died towards the end of making that as well. Uh, so maybe that was another reason why we thought, no, it's, it doesn't really belong in, on, on the album. There were, there were a few songs actually from Twisted that were, they were really good, but they just weren't quite rock enough or something. I want to ask about uh, not um, not where it's at because I think it's just such one of those songs that it's just like such a perfect lyrical premise. Uh, as far as you sort of, is it one of those things where you just, with the, if the idea pops in your head, you're like, I know this is just going to work. I know that I don't know how, yeah. I know how this is going to develop because from the first to the bridge to well, the chorus, pretty much. Because uh, Beck Beck had had a single out called Where It's At, and you know Beck yeah. was like as, as cool as school at that time. And uh, yeah, so uh, you're right. When it came to me, I just thought, oh, that's that's so easy. You know, th this guy's too <laughs> square, you know. <laughs> and it, it, and it, it's always nice writing songs that, that refer to the band and also the audience, because the band know we're not cool. So, so the audience know we're not cool. The band knows it's not cool. And uh, there's there's something to celebrate in that, because it's like, well, who cares? We, we really like this stuff, you know. It was just, that was, just seems like one of those things you just must have popped in, popped in your head and you thought, Oh, this is brilliant. This <laughs> is just like well, it's, like, it's, it's one of, it's as good. you're saying, it's one of those ideas that's easy to write. You know, once once you get a chord sequence for it, like, oh, that's and it and also it's you know it's trying to be quite funny. You know, um, yeah. But I mean, sometimes you get those ideas and they're they're just dogs to write. You cannot make them work. Yeah, I got I had one about Superman and Clark Kent, and I just couldn't get uh, being a Superman or being Clark Kent. I just couldn't get yeah. that to work at all. Just like can, it should have worked. Should it should, fine, it should but, work. It really should work. Yeah. But it just didn't work. And I played it to, to my wife and she was like, so you think I like the boring guy, do you? And they're like, you know, you know, <laughs> I'm not exciting enough for you. And I was like, that wasn't what I was saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm dropping this song completely. But that yeah, is a good so, idea. That's a good idea. I'm sorry you couldn't, you couldn't quite make it, it love. Well, listen, feel free. It could be the first <laughs> Madness Curry uh, collab, you know, so you may be, it may not be the, the manners of your choice, but you've got you've got one of us. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take your advice and not go there. 
<laughs> that's, that's a wise choice. <laughs> I think I think it would be tricky. I think the song itself is Kryptonite. I don't know what it, maybe that's what it is. Something, <laughs> but um, a friend of mine, Sandeep, who's um, he's a he's a friend of a friend that I met, and we just completely um, completely clicked on Delamitri. Basically, he's you're the sort right. of the, the the glue that binds our friendship. So I, oh, when sure. I told him when I told him that um, that I was in, uh, interviewing you, he was he's, uh, I said, look, have you got a question for him? I'll ask him. So his question right. is. This is this is Sandy. Uh, does it annoy you that people keep forgetting that "Don't Come Home Too Soon" is the greatest World Cup song ever? <laughs> well, I mean, I can I can see why a lot of people hated it, um, and it, I mean, it's not it's not even the greatest Scotland World Cup song ever because um, uh, I have a dream that um, John Gordon Sinclair is that Gordon? I can't remember his name. The guy was in uh, Gregory Girl. I, I I totally love that song, and I think three lines. I, I couldn't have written that song without three lines. I think three lines is a great song. I think because it's got, it's got enough. It was the first England football song that wasn't triumphalist. That was uh, had l real blue notes in it, a real melancholy, and and a kind of resigned. You know, if we've we've never we've never really got close since. You know, I I, I love that, and so I kind of I, I sort of took "Don't Come Home Too Soon." from that and had a bit more fun with it because Scotland, by that point, the Scotland team had just been regarded as complete no, no hopers. And I thought, well, we, we need to talk about this, you know, rather than going, oh, we're going to win the World Cup, well, let's go and beat <laughs> England and all that nonsense. Um, you've, you've just got to, you know, you've got to be frank about it. It's like nobody fancies us, so let's just kind of laugh about it and see, see, see if we get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the uh, the follow up question was: Do you think Jim Layton still uses Vaseline eyebrows as a conduit for his sweat? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it took me years to because it took me it was years before I found out why he was doing. I thought he did it to look hard. <laughs> Switchbox. So, uh, what's been the sort of highlight? What have been the sort of real proud proud moments for you over the over the years? Most of them happened in 1990 because that's when things started kicking off. Um, so the first time we did Barlands was extraordinary because we'd been playing to like 300, I think about 350 people. We did, we did the Tron Theatre and filled it. And then we did the Pavilion Theatre, which is a kind of pantomime theatre, we, and we filled that. So we were, our audience was growing slowly but surely. And then all of a sudden we were doing Barlands in, in May of 1990. I think it was May, it might, might be earlier, it might be in April. And um, there were a couple of thousand people there going, crazy and singing along to every word and that was extraordinary because that was your hometown and we didn't know these people I mean when we played to 350 people we knew a lot of them they were friends and friends of friends uh, and that was just it was brilliant it was just it was just it was just it was a fantastic venue um, as I always say about Barlands because it's got this art ceiling and it's got a pretty wide stage and the audience can get a lot of the audience can get quite close to the stage you get this sort of positive feedback loop where the sound gets thrown out into the hall, but the sound of the audience gets thrown back on stage. It's something to do with the arched roof. So the audience are deafening in Barlands and that, that just keys up the band more and the band just push a bit harder and then the audience push a bit harder. Um, and certainly when, you know, everybody was in their 20s, most of the audience was in their 20s then, uh, as were we. So there's load, just loads of energy in that room at, at when people are that age. And it's uh, Standing in that, I, mean, I, I swear to God, the band has a better time in Barlands than the, than the audience does. It's just because it sounds so loud on stage and so exciting. And then we did a couple of other things that were in 1990 that were just brilliant. We did a gig at a place called The Metro in Chicago uh, to a thousand people. We didn't know why there was a thousand people there. That was a lot of people for us to play to in Chicago at that time. Um, and we did a meet and greet after the show. The audience were just brilliant. And then we did a meet, meet and greet with local promoters and radio people and media people after the show we did that for an hour and then you know you, you sort of tired of doing that after a while because it's kind of diplomacy around you're not really doing you're not really doing the job of a musician you're doing the job of a diplomat uh, which is fine that's part of the gig and then after we did the meet and greet two of us went to a, a wee bar next door and uh, so this is like an hour and a half after we came off stage nice wee bar like kind of quite a funky wee place with a wee beer garden and I can't remember who I was with, but it was another member of the band. And we walked in and there were about 400 people in this bar. It was really packed. And they all just turned around and gave us a round of applause. 
because we had no because we just thought they were locals. We didn't realize it was, it was most of the people that had been in the gig had just gone to this bar next door. That's <laughs> so brilliant. I and mean, I've never walked into a room, I mean, even on my 50th birthday, I didn't get a round of fucking applause. <laughs> um, and then we did we did a tour of Australia that autumn, uh, and that was just that was kind of like the time of our lives, you know. It was because uh, we were kind of pop stars temporarily in Australia because we'd been on the telly quite a lot and. Um, we just got recognised everywhere. Everybody was so down to earth and nice, and you know, we met loads of people. We went went to loads of clubs after the gigs and danced and just had fun, you know. Um, and we did a gig, a gig in Sydney called Salinas, which I think was mainly just expat glass regions, and that was crazy. It was one of the loudest sounding audiences I've ever heard. So th- most of it, because, because 1990, all those things were firsts for us, so everything was really exciting, and then. Once you start going back to the same venues, you've done them before and there's, there's less excitement. Uh, it's just the first time they happen, things are just extraordinary. So what's the, uh, what's the plan going forward then? You've got the new album completely done. Yeah. Uh, and I've uh, heard that it's going to be next year re- release. Yeah, March, April, May or something. It keeps moving around. Um, but we're going we're to stick at least one track out on to stream this year. Uh, so there's a song called Close Your Eyes and Think of England, which is uh, coming out in October. Uh, and I think there might be another track. And then we'll start taking songs, sort of singles to radio in, in the new year. I think that's the plan. And this, this, uh, there was a talk of a, of a gig for NHS workers in Scotland. Is well, that's that still on the... Be, is that going to happen? No, probably not. I don't think anybody thinks... I don't think anybody's got a ticket thinks it's going to happen. Uh, but it's not officially been postponed or rescheduled yet um but we, as, as soon as we get an official word that it can't go ahead we'll just immediately reschedule it for next for next year uh i mean we're booking gigs next june and you know it's kind of a lottery whether they'll go ahead and we think the outdoor gigs might go ahead at the moment we think there's no reason to believe that indoor shows won't go ahead but it's everything's so unknown which makes it really you know if you've i mean i would buy a I would buy tickets for things next year, I think. Uh, but I would buy the tickets with the with the the knowledge in the back of my mind that they might get they might get postponed. And I think that's just what everybody's everybody's thinking. But you can't not book gigs because you know, at some point at some point these shows are gonna happen. We don't know at what point next year or when they're they're gonna happen, but they will happen. So you've got to book them. You've just got to book them and move them. You can't just go, we'll wait until we get the all clear because then it, all the venues will be stuffed you know they'll just be you won't get a place in any venue anywhere and a lot of venues might have gone out of business um so it's uh all you can really do is plan and cross your fingers that's all you can do it's a matter of if you build it they will come eventually (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly uh i mean we're trying to think of alternative ways of doing this and we're trying to think about online things and i mean we, we will do an online thing at some point um but we're just trying to think of ways of doing that that isn't that's not too cheap, but also that isn't, that's not trying to be a big live show that, you know, uh, there's something a bit more intimate. So we'll, we'll figure that out. I mean, we're sort of watching with the BDI what other people are doing and see, to trying to see what works and what doesn't work. Because loads of people are trying things out. Um, uh, I mean, it's, I, I go and see a, a, a thing called National Theatre Live quite a lot, where you go to a cinema and they live broadcast a play from the National Theatre. And, uh, I was really skeptical about it at first, but as soon as I started going to these things, it does feel like you're there. You know, you feel like you're with that National Theatre audience and it is a live performance and it kind of works. So that might have to be, that that might be the way things go for a while because you want, you know, you want to play. I think we have to find something authentic in some way that that kind of ticks that box because... The live stream, like us now sitting in our front rooms, whatever it is, you know, yeah. like, it doesn't I think people are bored of seeing people's sofas, you know. I think it's finding something that represents the live gigs in some way. Exactly. Be, there, there has to be a way of doing that. And, and I, think, yeah. I don't think anybody's quite found the solution yet, but uh, we will no. continue to search. And it's, you know, it's how you can do that and not lose money, and how you can do that and not, not be not be charging too much money to the audience because it's not a gig you know i mean I'll, I'll i'll spend 40 quid to go and see a gig quite happily but i'm you know i'm not gonna we don't want to spend 
would I want to watch Nick Cave on my computer? Well, I probably would, but I wouldn't want to pay that much money for it because it doesn't, it's not the real experience, you know. So all that needs to be figured out, I think. Uh, and, you know, people need to find out whether there's actually a market for it and they need to find, excuse me, using the word market. Um, or, and find out whether the audience like it or not, you know, whether, whether we like it, whether it feels like a shared experience or whether it feels like quite a depressing, isolated experience. We always ask for um, a recommendation on this show. Um, is there someone that, you'd, that you would recommend people check out they may not have heard of before? I listened to a lot of music after lockdown started, more than I normally would. I was listening to music like four or five hours a day. Um, but I've been listening to a lot, of, um, a lot of archive retro stuff and going through my record collection. And, and I subscribed to Tidal recently because I really like the sound quality of it. So I've been listening to a lot of things at like 24-bit master quality, which I really enjoy. But, you know, like Dylan things and Bob Stewart things and some jazz. And uh, so there's, there's nothing that's popping into my head. So I, I, no. I, I mean, the, this. I is, there, is there anything that really you feel that maybe has influenced the new, the new album that you feel like is, uh, what sort of that's influence good, have come into that? That's a good question. I mean, the weird thing about making this new album is that we were, we were trying to make a Delamitri record, so we were quite conscious of what we'd done in the past without trying to ape it or copy it. Um, so, the, this, unusually, this album, usually when we make an album, there'll be two or three albums that we want it to sound like or, or capture some element of that, like listen to the way that's mixed or listen to the way the drums sound on that. On this record, this is the first time we didn't have that at all. We, we just... Uh, we just wanted to re record everything really cleanly and simply. Um, and the, Dan Austin, the producer, is a re re brilliant producer, brilliant engineer. Um, he's just over 10 years younger than us, and he'd come out of Bath Mole's studio, and he'd worked, when he was really young, he'd worked with quite a lot of the big trip-hop artists from Bristol and uh, in the studio in Bath. And so he brought... A, a certain element of that to what we were doing, which initially we, we quite liked. And then when we came to mixing, we actually took most of it out because we thought we were just trying to keep it really simple. So we didn't have a, you know, we didn't have a particular attitude other than just keep it plain and, and let's not do anything fancy. Let's just keep it. So we were kind of trying to make a classic pop rock record. One of the things we really referenced on a particular song was the new young album, everyone knows this is nowhere, which is really simple. It's just four players, most of it, no overdubs, and very quite harsh, not brittle, but quite harsh guitar sounds. Because we, the, the mixes first started off sounding very warm and and uh, comforting and kind of retro in a sort of seventies sort of way, and we actually went more back to the sixties for the way we approached mixing it. So we were. We were definitely listening to stuff from the late 60s rather than stuff from the early 70s where things got a lot warmer and sort of drier. Um, so yeah, the, the only thing we directly referenced was, um, everyone knows this is nowhere. And actually I'd been listening to a lot of early Wire. I'd been listening to the first three Wire albums, especially the first two Wire albums, which are incredibly dry and simple and very elegant, elegantly uh, arranged records. So that, that was quite an influence as well, certainly for me. Well, thanks so much for joining us here. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. And uh, yeah, sorry, sorry the line dropped out, but we just we were just we were discussing Jim Jim Layton's eyebrows at the time. So maybe <laughs> don't, don't mention Jim Layton's eyebrows. <laughs> maybe he's got some sort of button. That he's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. All right. So thanks very much. So, you know, good luck with the album. I, I really look forward to uh, to hearing it. It's going to be a real uh, real pleasure to to hear that this because uh, it sounds like you you guys are really sort of just it's just you guys on it and as you you know this yeah. simple approach and it's just like I feel like it's going to be a pure elementary it'll be great yeah I mean I, I, I really love it I have to say um, so I've got I've got I've got high hopes for not it not being disappointing even though we're 20 years older or 25 years older you know it's it's uh, which is a big change but I think we've still got we still captured the essence of what of what's what's good about Delamitri. I don't think we've uh, I don't think we've strayed from the path in any way ways, which was an interesting exercise in its own right. So I I I personally think we've got it right. Other people may feel like it's 
it's moved into a different sort of zone. Um, I don't think so. I think it's still the same ethos, um, really, from the first in the album right the way through the, the albums in the nineties. So I hope it, I hope it goes down all right with the audience. Oh, I'm sure it will. Um, you've been co- making consistently great music for years, so I don't think there's any reason why it's changed. Thanks, now. Thanks very much, Justin. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Loved it. Take care. Speak all right. Take care. Bye. Cheers Bye. now. Bye-bye. Bye bye.